Tisha, where are we right now? We're right here on the Mount of Beatitudes. The Mount of Beatitudes is actually where the Sermon on the Mount took place. So the facility that we're standing in right now mm -hmm. is, is a Catholic structure that was built here? Yes, and it was built by orders of Mussolini. Uh -huh. Mussolini. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. And they built it to commemorate where the Sermon on the Mount took place. Now they built the church like most Byzantine churches in an octagonal structure. Mm -hmm. And that was in this case to commemorate each of the Beatitudes, all starting with the uh -huh. word blessed. Right. Uh, in Hebrew, the actual word is ashrei, which is not a, a, it's not blessed, it's actually happiness, better translated. Uh -huh. Not a ha ha ha, he 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 happiness, but a contentment and a happiness that God alone can give us. So this church was built in 1927, but most people and most scholars believe that the Sermon on the Mount actually took place just down below. Mm -hmm. There's a natural amphitheater uh, that the banana patch forms a natural amphitheater and the acoustics are phenomenal. So very likely down below was the accurate location. So the, obviously the Sermon of the Mount is a very famous part of the Bible mm -hmm. and, uh, and a very uh, foundational aspect of understanding you know, Christ's teachings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're on the north side of the, the Sea of uh, Galilee or right. all these other terms that they use for that. Mm -hmm. So basically uh, when, when Christ was uh, giving the sermon, he would have been doing it facing the sea. Well, the scripture says that he went up on a mountain, right? Uh -huh. And so we believe he was facing the sea mm -hmm. and addressing the crowd uh, down below, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so the crowd formed down below, he was up on the mountain. Mm -hmm. And so basically where we're standing now, we're looking out. So this is kind of the view he had while he was giving this inspired sermon. Right. Wow. So this area is where most scholars feel like the actual sermon took place. Right. So the area right here actually forms a natural amphitheater. Mm -hmm. The acoustics are phenomenal. Yeah. And so although we do have the traditional church up here, this is where most scholars feel that yes. the Sermon on the Mount took place. Well, you could see it kind of rounds out. Mm -hmm. And so he would have, Jesus would have stood here and the crowds would have been right down there. Right. Yeah, it does make sense when you look at it visually. You can imagine the trees were people and he'd be up here yep. speaking to thousands down below. Wow. Quite a sight. This area, this general area that we're in, right. uh, I think you said something like 75% of the gospel happens right around here, I mean, in a very tight area. Mm -hmm. So give me some background on the history of Jesus as it relates to this, this place. I think it's really important because we're starting right now, the, mm -hmm. uh, the center of his ministry. Like we said, three quarters of the gospel took place in a tiny little, like five, six mile triangle. Mm -hmm. And we're right here right now. But let's go back to who Jesus was. Now, he wasn't from this area. Uh -huh. Jesus actually grew up in Nazareth, uh, and we remember his famous synagogue speech in Nazareth. Right. And that infuriated, he quoted from the book of Isaiah and said, this is fulfilled before you. Right. It infuriated the people of Nazareth. They actually led him to a brow of a hill uh -huh. and wanted to throw him off. And scripture says that he disappeared from their midst right. and begins his public ministry right here. Mm -hmm. Now. It's, I think it's important to go back and realize who was Jesus. Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us that he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us that he grew up in Nazareth. Mm -hmm. And scripture tells us that he was a rabbi. Right. So much so, you know who called him rabbi? Not his followers. His followers called him master or Lord. Right. It was the Pharisees that uh. called him rabbi. So they weren't gonna give him any credit that he didn't deserve. Right. And so uh, also what's important is to realize that he would have um, been teaching like the rabbis of his time would have right. taught. Right. Jesus is our Messiah, mm -hmm. but how do we, you know, there's a lot of years we don't know where he was. Right. If you think about it, the last time we hear about him in the temple, he was 12. Mm -hmm. And the next thing he reappears right here at the age of 30. That's a lot of years you don't know where he was. Right. And from his hometown of Nazareth, which is you know, behind you, I think, mm -hmm. you know, as I'm looking, right. uh, how far are we from Nazareth? We're about a 30 minute drive. Yeah, so walking it's <laughs> uh, a yes. couple days maybe. Half, at, least, at least a day's walk yeah. probably. Yeah. But we have to have a little bit of background on where he was. And I can take you all the way back to the age of three. Okay. You see, because Jewish, uh, Jesus was a Jewish boy growing up mm -hmm. with the typical Jewish religion. And so we know from the early, uh, the early books and early Jewish uh, literature, we know exactly what the Jewish boys would have been doing. Mm -hmm. And so at the age of three, a Jewish boy would have been memorizing the book of Psalms mm -hmm. as his father would have sang the book of songs to him. Right. By the age of five, he would have been committing to memory the book of Leviticus mm -hmm. as his father would have been teaching him that. 
the age of 10, most Jewish boys would even have the old, uh, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, mm -hmm. committed to memory. Mm -hmm. By the age of 13, a Jewish boy comes into manhood mm -hmm. and most Jewish boys had the Old Testament committed to memory. Right. And we're already moving on to study the Mishnah, mm -hmm. which was an oral law that was handed down from generation to generation from the time of Moses until it was compiled in Tiberias right. in the second century. Mm -hmm. By the age of 18, a Jewish boy would be pursuing his vocation. And age of 20, the same thing. Jesus was a carpenter, right? right. Or a stonemason, right. right? That's right. And then at the age of 30, get this one, the Jewish people believe that a Jewish male came into his full vigor mm. and only then was he ready for his public ministry. Right. So at the age of 30, Jesus comes into his public ministry. Remember in the first, uh, the first miracle when he's turning the water into wine right. and his mother comes to him and says, hey, we're out of wine. And he says, woman, my time has not yet come. Uh -huh. He wasn't 30 yet, right. but he did the miracle anyways. But at the age of 30, he comes onto the scene in his public ministry and he has three years uh -huh. to change the world. Three years. I think it's interesting because it's like approximately 65,000 thoughts go through our mind a day. Yeah. He didn't have a second, a moment that wouldn't count for the kingdom. He was a kingdom person mm -hmm. at all times. And that's the essence of the Beatitudes, attitudes for kingdom people to be in. And that's what that means, attitudes mm -hmm. for kingdom people. And, so, and basically this ministry happened mostly right here where we are. Mm -hmm. And as you said, Nazareth was not that far from here, half hour by car. And then he appeared here and this is where so many of the stories unfold. That's right. This is where they unfold. And then you have to understand that when Jesus was teaching, he taught in a way that was typical to rabbis called um, remez. What is remez? It means alluding to. Right. So if we've already established that Jewish men during the time of Jesus had scripture committed to memory, all a rabbi would have to do is a wor say a word, a key, a phrase, and all of a sudden an entire passage would explode in the listener's mind and you would know exactly what he was pointing back to in scripture. So Mussolini had this place built when? In 1927. Now what gave him the land rights to be able to do this? Well, different churches came in and purchased land and ordered the erection of churches on the original, uh, many are on the original sites where Helena had designated. In this particular case, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so they built it in 1927 and an architect by the name of Antonio Barlucci mm -hmm. built it. Yeah, this obviously is a very popular spot for people to show up and visit. You can see a lot of activity around us. People come from all over the yeah. world. They have that one time where they want to make a pilgrimage and see where scripture took place. Yeah, yeah, amazing. <laughs> prophets walked and, and the miracles took place. Yeah. That's it for this particular interview. Thanks for joining me. Really excited to take this ongoing journey with you as we keep bringing more content. If you haven't already, you really should subscribe to this channel. There's a lot of phenomenal content coming down the road into the future that you'll want to know about. Leave a comment down here. I think people would love to hear from you and then you can hear from them too. If you liked it, go ahead and give a like. It only takes half a second and share this with people that you care about. The world needs more light in it right now. So thanks for being with me. Hope to connect with you again soon.